Now, I never saw Jurassic World, but I have it on good authority that there was a really big mosasaur in it that ate sharks, um, and that's fine, and it's nice and scary, but mosasaurs probably spent a lot more time eating ammonites than eating sharks because the oceans were full of ammonites. Once they made it through the Great Dying, they exploded in abundance and diversity, and they were just the greatest snack if you were a mosasaur. Um, not to mention the fact that if you were an ichthyosaur, you really liked to chow down on these early squid relatives called vellum knights. They were just eating them left and right. Um, and what I, I, you might, it might sound like um, I'm saying that things were really bad for the cephalopods. And it's true that everything in the ocean wanted to eat them. But it's what's amazing to me is that everything in the ocean wanted to eat them, and they still did fine. They were incredibly abundant throughout all of this time of being these like swimming protein bars for all of the marine reptiles. And it just goes to show how well adapted they were to their environment that despite all of the predation, they could survive and thrive. I mean, it wasn't even just marine reptiles. Uh, the sh early sharks and rays and other fish were going after them as well. This is one of my very favorite fossils. It's an early shark relative, a chondrichthian. And it's a little bit hard to see, but its head um, is pointing sort of off the screen and it's got some fins spread out to the top and bottom. And then um, kind of in the middle, a little bit lower down, there's a bunch of what look like little needles or little bullets. And all of those little things of which there are hundreds are the shells of vellum knights, the, those thunderstones that I talked about that are the internal shell of a squid-like relative. And so this early shark, when it died and was fossilized, had a belly full of these early cephalopods, like hundreds of them. And some paleontologists have even speculated that the reason it died was that it OD'd on vellum nights. It ate too many of them and its stomach got too full and heavy and it sank to the bottom and got buried. I don't think we'll ever know if that's actually what happened, but it is a kind of interesting story. And it just goes to show how abundant these animals were, that they were everywhere. Uh, everything that could catch them was eating them and they were still doing fine for themselves. Um, and not only were they doing fine for themselves, but they were holding their own as predators. Remember, I talked about those early cephalopods as being predators that want to catch prey and eat whatever they can get. Um, and these vellum knights, the same ones that are being devoured in huge numbers by the big fish, are also eating lots of little fish. Um, and this is a fossil and an illustration from a study that came out um, just last year of uh, which is called Predatory Behavior and Taphonomy of a Jurassic Bellumnoid Coleoid, which is how titles are usually written in scientific literature, but I rewrote it for drama as breaking news, belligerent bellumnites buried. And what happened was these bellumnites were in the middle of catching and eating fish when they sank down into deep water because they were distracted by their delicious meal of fish and they died because of the low oxygen in the deep water and got buried. And so this is actually the first picture that I put up here is a fossilized bellum knight holding a, a fish that it was in the process of catching and eating, which is always a really exciting paleontological find when people come across these things because I was telling you it's hard to know how ancient animals ate and we weren't there it's it's really hard but every now and then you get a fossil like this that actually tells you these guys ate fish and it's just so satisfying because fish have been hunting and competing with cephalopods ever since fish evolved so I really enjoy it when cephalopods eat fish and kind of turn the tables a little bit just makes me very happy um and I also like to point out that compared to everything else that was in the Cretaceous, they can really hold their own. So here's a picture of all of the amazing dinosaurs that were living on land, Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops and all these cool little velociraptors and things. And they're fine. There's nothing wrong with dinosaurs. But honestly, look at what was in the ocean. It was wild down there. These are ammonites that evolved in the Cretaceous with just the wackiest shells. Um, and the shapes of these shells got super, like almost Baroque, very elaborate, uh, coiled like ice cream cones, tied in a knot. Some of them are folded like paper clips. And meanwhile, we have very dramatic and colorful early squid and early octopuses that are evolving at the same time, like Pasolotuthis and Paleoctopus. Um, and so if you could have gone back in time to the Cretaceous, it would be fine if you wanted to spend some time admiring the dinosaurs, but don't forget to bring your scuba gear so that you can jump in the ocean and see these amazing, amazing cephalopods that lived at the time. And we still don't even know why most of them had these super weird shell shapes or what they were doing with them. So there's a lot yet to learn about these guys. Um, and I'd also like to point out, um, again, compared to dinosaurs who are fantastic and wonderful, 
that cephalopods have been around twice as long. So those early giants that we saw the picture of those long straight shelled cephalopods called Camaraceras, they were living 470 million years ago. So almost 500 million years ago in almost in sort of paleontological terms. And they were getting really, really big. They were huge and bizarre. And then in the Cretaceous, same time as T-Rex and all of those, you're getting these really huge aminoids, big enough for a person to crawl in and live inside of that shell, um, which just sounds amazing. And so the amount of time that they covered is twice as long as dinosaurs were alive, um, which is just mind boggling to me that they were able to know what's coming, what ended the dinosaurs, um, also ended the cephalopods. They met their fiery doom when an asteroid crashed into the earth at the end of the Cretaceous, caused another mass extinction, not quite as bad as the great dying, but still enormously dramatic. Um, but wait, you say there are still cephalopods, and you would be right, because there are also still dinosaurs. Um, and ammonites we are not and this is still one of the most fascinating topics to study in paleontology um, that doesn't have a clear-cut answer yet why did the animals that went extinct go extinct and how did the ones that survived survive um, and they, for a lot of groups of animals there's beginning to be a lot of interesting answers um, and so i'm going to dig in a little bit to what we think might have helped the surviving cephalopods survive, and then um, how they've evolved in the oceans today to be the uh, wild and wacky animals that we know and love and celebrate um, every October 8th through 12th. So we know that they have their tentacles, and they already had those. Um, the, you've seen the pictures of the ancient squid and octopuses that were surviving this great extinction. They already had their tentacles. Um, they almost certainly had great camouflage already, although camouflage itself does not fossilize, so it's hard to be sure. But we know they had their shells inside their bodies, which would have opened up the opportunity for this camouflage to evolve in their skin. We know for sure that they had ink because we do have fossilized ink sacs um, from the Cretaceous, uh, from the Jurassic even, I think is the earliest fossilized ink sac. So we know that these early coleoids, early squid and octopus relatives evolved ink as one of their defensive strategies um, fairly early on. We don't have any fossilized intelligence, unfortunately. So uh, we can't be sure about that one, but based on the large brains and nervous systems that we see in squid and octopuses and their relatives today. And based on what we know of their evolution, we think that this was probably evolving around the same time when the shell was coming inside and they were developing camouflage and they had to control all of these limbs, all of these squishy tentacles that can go in every direction. The brain and the complexity of the nervous system and behavior evolved right alongside that. So all these things were already there. However, none of them once again, these are the things that we think of that make cephalopods cephalopods, but none of them are the real um, sort of strategy that seems to be working so well for modern cephalopods. That's yet another feature um, that we think of as live fast, die young. Uh, and so almost all of the cephalopods around today, your squids and octopuses and cuttlefish, have very short lifespans. Um, the smaller ones live less than a year. They, are, they hatch, they grow up to maturity, and they have babies in a matter of months. And even the very big animals, like giant squid and giant octopus, are still growing all the way to be that big and reproducing and dying in just a few years, maybe three, four, five years. Um, so, so this is how I, to complete the strategy, um, live fast, die young is all well and good for an individual animal, but if you want your species to survive, you need to live fast, die young, and leave a disintegrating corpse after your body destroys itself to make millions of babies. And it's the key point here is to make millions of babies before you die. And that is what cephalopods do so, so, so well. So many species today just grow up in a matter of months or a couple of years and spawn 
thousands or millions of eggs into the water. And as you can imagine, most of those babies do not survive to become adults, but they don't have to. Um, only a few of them need to, to replace the population. And when the environmental conditions are good, when the temperature is right and when the food is available and everything else is just right, then a lot more of them can survive. And it means that as a group, these animals can really take advantage of good conditions and respond quickly to when the ocean is just the way they want it and really proliferate to fill that space. Um, and in fact, there has been a global proliferation of cephalopods um, since about 1960. This data was gathered. I know there's a lot of squiggly lines and charts and you don't have to read all of the little numbers. But the point here is just to look at these charts and see that there's a blue line trending up from about 1960 to about 2010. And what that blue line is measuring is the abundance of squid and octopus and cuttlefish in the ocean. And across many different species, across many different parts, of the ocean from near the shore to way out in the open ocean, they have been getting more abundant. And scientists think that this is a, a feature of this live fast, die young, make lots of babies lifestyle, where compared to a lot of other animals, they're kind of uniquely equipped to coping with a changing ocean that's changing as humans fish more and more species out of it um, as anthropogenic climate change progresses, a lot of cephalopod species can really take advantage. And this has led to a whole school of thought, welcome squid overlords. You can purchase this on a t-shirt um, if you want to show your support for the inevitable world domination of cephalopods. Um, I'm speaking tongue in cheek there, of course, we have no evidence that they will ever in, uh, in the near future evolve any ability to move on to dry land. So there's really nothing to worry about there but they are um, for the most part doing really well, uh, which is fascinating. And it tells us a lot about the oceans and how they work. And then an interesting thing too, is to consider this might be on average for looking at a lot of species altogether, but not all cephalopods are exactly the same. And you may notice that there is one particular kind of cephalopod that is not represented on this chart. I said octopuses, squid and cuttlefish. What about those pearly nautilus, the nautiluses with the chambered shell, which are the last cephalopods that still have this shell that they pump the liquid out of, let the gas flow into that makes them buoyant. I mean, these hardly even look like cephalopods if you're comparing them to squid and octopuses. We have to remember they're part of the same group. They're part of the same lineage. They're from the same 500 million year old ancestors. And in their own way, they are well adapted to the oceans that they're living in. Um, However, they seem to be less well adapted than all of those other cephalopods to dealing with humans. Um, so I call this little cautionary tale, the pearly nautilus or why we can't have nice things. Um, and the story revolves around the fact that they have these beautiful external shells and they're so beautiful and they're so pearly that everybody wants one. And so um, since antiquity, people have been collecting nautilus shells. And that doesn't just mean picking up the shells of a dead animal that happens to wash up on the beach. It means fishing the live ones and killing them and collecting their shells and selling them. Um, and over time, that has led to a dramatic decrease in nautilus populations. Fortunately, um, just in the last few years, there's been a growing recognition that we need to protect these animals, that they and their shells can't withstand being collected at the rate people wanted to own Nautilus shells. And so CITES, which is the same international treaty that protects rhinos and elephants and lions and all kinds of big name endangered species now also protect cephalopods. Um, as of 2016, all of the member nations voted and nautiluses are protected internationally. Um, and as of 2018, they are also protected on the U.S.'s Endangered Species Act, um, which is fairly important because the U.S. was a, uh, and to a certain extent remains one of the biggest importers of nautilus shells um, and now that and that used to be a fairly unregulated industry and now that nautiluses are on the endangered species act there's more regulations going into place and so i'm optimistic that this story might turn to the pearly nautilus or why we can have nice things maybe the jury's still out but i'm optimistic so here we are, we've got our nautiluses struggling, but beginning to see some legal protection. Uh, we've got a lot of cephalopods doing extremely well. And here at the very end of my talk, I thought I would bring up mention of one other cephalopod uh, because I was not quite truthful when I said that the nautilus is the only cephalopod with an external shell. 
we also have a kind of octopus called an argonaut that makes its own shell. And here on one side, we have a picture of six different argonaut shells, different species of argonauts. And on the other side, you have a drawing of what the animal looks like both inside and outside of its shell. Um, it is an octopus like other octopuses. It has eight arms. Two of those arms are weirdly spread into these petals or membranes or sails. You can see if you look at the tiny writing on this old drawing, it's actually called the sailing cuttlefish. They called it a cuttlefish because people didn't use to really distinguish between cuttlefish and octopus and squid. It is an octopus. Um, and they thought that it used this, these big, two big spread out arms to sail. Uh, and so there was actually, um, it's, they thought it sits in its shell. Its shell looks kind of like a boat. Maybe it sits in its boat um, and it uses, flings up its two arms like sails. And this is a drawing of what people for thousands of years thought Argonaut octopuses did um, without ever having seen it happen. This is complete fantasy, <laughs> complete fiction, just based on looking at the dead animals washed up on the beach and what the shells look like. And another interesting thing is that the shell itself reminded a lot of people of those ammonite fossils. So remember, ammonite fossils are coiled shells of cephalopods that lived a long time ago that are not octopuses. They're a different kind of cephalopod. But the shape of the shell looked so much like the octopus argonauts shell that people thought ancient ammonites must have done the same thing as modern argonauts. So even though this is a total fantasy, imagining that argonauts were sailors flinging their arms up into the air like sails, uh, early paleontologists adopted the fantasy for ammonites. And here in this, which is one of the very earliest artistic reconstructions of a paleontological scene called Duria Antiquior. In the background, I've circled in blue a, what the artist drew as an ammonite with its arms up in the air sailing like a modern argonaut. So both of these pictures are completely wrong. Um, but it took people a long time to figure that out. And uh, to understand the Argonaut octopus and why it had these two membranous arms and what it was doing with them um, took this completely fascinating and pioneering scientist who lived in uh, the early 1800s, a French woman named Jean Viapru Power. And she was born Jean Viapru. She married James Power and adopted both names. Um, and at a time when most married women did not do that. And she did a lot of other things that most women did not do in her time, um, including wander all around the island of Sicily, describing everything she saw and invent the modern aquarium so that she could put Argonaut octopuses into an aquarium in her house and figure out what they were doing. And so she was really the first person who studied Argonaut octopuses when they were alive instead of just looking at dead ones. And not only did she bring them into her house, but she would go out in a boat and look at them in the ocean. Um, she said that she would feed them until they would come up and take food from her hands. And she was really out there, one of the very first marine biologists who ever went out in the ocean and studied animals in their natural habitat. Um, and so Jean Viapru was the one who discovered that the Argonaut octopus does not sail like a little sailor with its arms up in the air, but instead it uses those arms, those membranous arms to grow its shell. They're a special kind of material that can actually grow that shell. And they're the only cephalopod that does it that way. There's no other cephalopod, not pearly nautiluses, um, not anything that we know of that uses its arms to make a shell. So they really are one of the weirdest octopuses out there. And this is Jean's painting of them. She did this beautiful watercolor painting of an Argonaut octopus properly, not sailing at the surface, but hanging out um, at the bottom as they sometimes do, as well as in the drawing that I did where you can see it swimming around um, with its body sort of poking out of its shell. So this, um, I wanted to end on this because it's such a weird conglomeration of different cephalopod features and because it's the subject of my next book. Um, so coming out next year, I have a biography of this really fascinating woman, Jean via Prue Power and how she grew up in the French countryside during the French Revolution and became um, one of the first modern marine biologists. So look for that. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun to, to talk about then. And um, with that, um, I will point out the book that I already have out that just came out called Monarchs of the Sea, The Extraordinary 500 Million Year History of Cephalopods which is all the stories I've been talking about today and lots more. And thank you all so much for your attention. I really, really appreciate it.